Welcome back to Anatomica. In this session, we will be discussing on the details of abdominal part of esophagus and stomach. The learning objectives of this session will be explain blood supply, nerve supply, lymphatic drainage and applied aspects of abdominal part of esophagus, interpret clinical basis for esophageal varices, hold stomach in anatomical position, identify external features of stomach, trace peritoneal relations of stomach, explain structures forming stomach bed and their clinical relevance, explain visceral relations of stomach, explain blood supply, nerve supply, lymphatic drainage of stomach, justify anatomical basis of lymphatic spread in carcinoma stomach, correlate the normal anatomy of stomach with its applied aspects, infer different types of vagotomy. The abdominal part of esophagus is just 1.25 cm in length. It enters the abdomen through the esophageal opening of the diaphragm situated at the level of 10th thoracic vertebra slightly to the left of median plane runs downward and to the left in front of the left crust of the diaphragm and behind the left lobe of liver to end by opening into cardiac end of stomach at an acute angle situated at the level of 11th thoracic vertebra about 2.5 cm to the left of the median plane. Thus, the abdominal part of esophagus extends only from 10th thoracic vertebra to 11th thoracic vertebra. Its right border becomes continuous with the lesser curvature of the stomach, whereas its left border is separated from the fundus of the stomach by a notch called cardiac notch. It is covered by peritoneum only anteriorly and to the left. Anteriorly, it is related to the anterior vagal trunk and the left lobe of liver. Posteriorly, it is related to the posterior vagal trunk and the diaphragm. On the left side, it is related to esophageal branches of the left gastric artery and accompanying veins. The abdominal esophagus is supplied by the branches from the left gastric artery, a branch of the celiac trunk and branches from the left inferior phrenic artery. The abdominal part of the esophagus has a mixed venous drainage via two routes. The veins of the abdominal esophagus return blood through plexuses to the left gastric and upper short gastric veins. The left gastric vein meets the lower esophageal veins at the esophageal opening in the lesser curvature and then drains into the portal vein. The rest of the venous blood from abdominal part of esophagus drain into hemiazygous, then into azygous and the systemic circulation that is into superior vena cava. These two routes form a portosystemic anastomosis, a connection between the portal and systemic venous systems. The lymphatic drainage of the abdominal esophagus drains into the left gastric and to the left and right pericardial nodes. Lymph from the posterior surface is drained directly to the uppermost para-aortic nodes. The sympathetic supply of the abdominal part comes from the 5th to 12th thoracic spinal nerves, while the parasympathetic source is the esophageal plexus formed by the right and left vagal trunks. Variation of vagal trunks is important during vagotomy. There may be more than one vagal trunks on both sides. A surgeon should be aware of these variations and be careful because more than one branch can be found in anterior or posterior vagal trunk or both. Coming to the clinical anatomy, esophageal varices are abnormally dilated submucosal veins in the wall of the esophagus that lie within the anastomosis. They are usually produced when the pressure in the portal system increases beyond normal, a state known as the portal hypertension. Portal hypertension most commonly occurs secondary to chronic liver disease such as cirrhosis or an obstruction in the portal vein. The varices are predisposed to bleeding with most patients presenting with hematemesis which is vomiting of blood. Alcoholics are at high risk of developing esophageal varices. Achalasia cardia is the difficulty in swallowing. Usually, the lower end of esophagus is closed and dilates only during the passage of food. However, due to the neuromuscular incoordination, it may fail to dilate leading to difficulty in passage of food or dysphagia. This leads to accumulation of food and marked dilatation in the esophagus. 
In certain clinical conditions, squamous epithelium of lower esophagus may be replaced by the columnar epithelium. This condition is called Barrett's esophagus. Coming to the developmental anomalies, which are the defects of esophagus present by birth. In tracheoesophageal fistula, the separation of trachea and esophagus may not be complete. Proximal segment ends in a blind pouch leading to esophageal atresia and distal segment communicates with trachea. In esophageal stenosis, the lumen of esophagus may be abnormally narrowed due to improper canalization. The lower end of esophagus is commonly prone to inflammation, ulceration due to regurgitation of acid from the stomach and carcinoma. With this, we complete the abdominal part of esophagus. To recap till now, we discussed on location, relations, blood supply, nerve supply, lymphatic drainage and clinical anatomy of abdominal part of esophagus. Next, we will discuss on the details of stomach. Let us start stomach with the functions. The stomach is dilated portion of the alimentary canal or GIT and has the following main functions. It stores food in its own capacity. It mixes the food with gastric secretions to form a semi-fluid chyme of uniform consistency due to repeated churning, allows digestion of proteins to proteases and peptones with the help of enzyme pepsin in acid medium, secretes abundant mucus which acts as protective barrier of mucous membrane against auto-digestion and it controls the rate of delivery of the chyme to the small intestine so that efficient digestion and absorption can take place. The stomach is situated in the upper part of the abdomen, extending from beneath the left costal margin. Much of the stomach lies under cover of the lower ribs, positioned between the abdominal esophagus and the small intestine. The stomach is in the epigastric, umbilical and left hypochondrium regions of the abdomen. It is roughly J-shaped, although its size and shape vary considerably. It tends to be high and transverse in the obese, short subject and to be vertically elongated in the asthenic, that is tall and thin individual. Even in the same person, its shape depends on whether it is full or empty, on the position of the body and on the face of respiration. It, it has the following presenting parts. Two openings, the cardiac and the pyloric orifices two curvatures, the greater and the lesser curvatures, and two surfaces, an anterior and a posterior surface. The stomach is relatively fixed at both ends, but is very mobile in between. It has three subdivisions, fundus, body, and pylorus. The cardiac orifice is where the esophagus enters the stomach. Although no anatomical sphincter can be demonstrated here, a physiological mechanism exists that prevents regurgitation of stomach contents into the esophagus. It is situated about 2.5 cm to the left of the median plane behind the 7th costal cartilage opposite the 11th thoracic vertebra, 10 cm deep to anterior abdominal wall and 40 cm away from the incisor teeth. The sphincter is classified as a physiological or functional sphincter as it does not have any specific sphincteric muscle. Instead, the sphincter is maintained by four factors. Esophagus enters the stomach at an acute angle. Walls of the intra-abdominal section of the esophagus are compressed when there is a positive intra-abdominal pressure. Prominent mucosal folds at the gastroesophageal junction aid in occluding the lumen. Right crust of the diaphragm as a pinch cock effect. During esophageal per peristalsis, the sphincter is relaxed to allow food to enter the stomach. Otherwise, at rest, the function of this sphincter is to prevent the reflex of acid gastric contents into the esophagus. Anteriorly, the cardiac orifice is covered by peritoneum and overlapped by the left lobe of liver. Posteriorly, it is non peritoneal over a triangular bare area and connected with the left crust of the diaphragm by gastrophrenic ligament. Sometimes, a part of left suprarenal gland intervenes between the cardiac orifice and left crust. The pyloric orifice is formed by the pyloric canal, which is about uh, 1 inch or 2.5 centimeters long. 
It is situated about 1.25 cm to the right of the midline at the lower border of L1 vertebra when stomach is empty and the person is in supine position. The circular muscle coat of the stomach is much thicker here and forms the anatomic and physiologic pyloric sphincter. Function of the pyloric sphincter is it controls the outflow of gastric contents into the duodenum. The sphincter receives motor fibers from the sympathetic system and inhibitory fibers from the vagi. In addition, the pylorus is controlled by local nervous and uh, hormonal influences from the stomach and duodenal walls. For example, the stretching of the stomach due to filling will stimulate the myentric nerve plexus in its wall and reflexly cause relaxation of the sphincter. The pylorus is anteriorly covered with peritoneum, quadrate lobe of liver, falciform ligament of liver and posteriorly related to neck of pancreas separated by lesser sac. The lesser curvature forms the right border of the stomach and extends from the cardiac orifice to the pylorus. The most dependent part of the curvature is marked by a depression called angular notch or incisura angularis. It is suspended from the liver by the lesser omentum. The greater curvature is much longer than the lesser curvature, forms the left border of stomach and extends from the left cardiac orifice over the doom of fundus and along the left border of the stomach to the pylorus. At the upper end, it presents an angle formed between esophagus and greater curvature card, called cardiac notch which is five times longer than the incisura angularis. Greater curvature gives attachment to three ligaments. Gastrophrenic ligament, which extends from fundus of stomach to the diaphragm. Gastrosplenic ligament or the omentum, which extends from the upper part of the greater curvature to the spleen. And the greater omentum extends from the lower part of the greater curvature to the transverse colon. The two layers of the lesser omentum at the lesser curvature of the stomach splits to enclose the two surfaces of stomach. After enclosing anterior and posterior surface of stomach, the two layers of peritoneum meet at the greater curvature and continue to form the three ligaments from above downwards as mentioned earlier. All these together forms the peritoneal relations of stomach. The stomach which has two surfaces, anterior and posterior surfaces. The anterior surface is also called as antero superior surface. It faces forwards and upwards. The posterior surface is also called posterior inferior surface. It faces backwards and downwards. The anterior surface is related to left lobe of the liver, the diaphragm, which is attached to the ribs, the left pleura and lung in the space between ribs and diaphragm, the left costal margin and the anterior abdominal wall below the costal margin. The space between the left costal margin, the sixth costal cartilage, which represents roughly lower border of liver and inferior border of lung and mid-axillary line is called trabe space. On percussion, there is resonant note usually, but in cases with splenomegaly or pleural effusion, a dull note is felt. Posteriorly, the stomach is related to structures forming stomach bed. The structures forming posterior relations of stomach are called a stomach bed. The lesser sac separates the structures forming stomach bed and the posterior surface of stomach. The following are the structures forming stomach bed, the diaphragm in the upper part of the stomach, the spleen on the left side, the pancreas extending from right to left side, the transverse mesocolon extending from pancreas to transverse colon, the transverse colon, the upper part of the left kidney, the left suprarenal gland and the splenic artery. The stomach is divided broadly into following two subdivisions, the larger cardiac and the smaller pyloric parts by the line drawn downwards and to the left from the incisura angularis to the greater curvature. 
the larger cardiac part is further subdivided into fundus and body the smaller pyloric part is subdivided into pyloric antrum and pyloric canal fundus is dome shaped and projects upward and to the left of the cardiac orifice it is usually filled with uh, full of gas in x rays it is seen as dark area under the left dome of the diaphragm body extends from the level of cardiac orifice to the level of incisura angularis a constant notch in the lower part of lesser curvature some authors discuss one more part the cardia which surrounds the opening of the esophagus into the stomach pyloric antrum extends from the incisura angularis to the pyloric canal the pyloric canal is more most uh, tubular part of the stomach extending between the pyloric antrum and the duodenum the outlet of the stomach is called pyloric orifice which is marked on the surface of the organ by the pyloric constriction and surrounded by a thickened ring of gastric circular muscle called the pyloric sphincter the pyloric orifice is just to the right of midline in a plane that passes through the lower border of first lumbar vertebra called as the transpyloric plane the mucosa of an empty stomach is thrown into temporary folds called rugae these rugae are longitudinal along the lesser curvature when the stomach distends when it is full these rugae disappear the part of the lumen near the lesser curvature along with longitudinal folds is called gastric canal or mesenstrasy this area allows rapid passage of swallowed liquids along lesser curvature directly into the lower part before it spreads into other parts of the stomach because of this it is more prone to peptic ulcers in blood supply to the stomach let us first discuss the arterial supply and then venous drainage the arteries are derived from the branches of the celiac artery or trunk the left gastric artery arises from the celiac artery it passes upward and to the left to reach the esophagus and then descends along the lesser curvature of the stomach it supplies the lower third of the esophagus and the upper right part of the stomach the right gastric artery arises from the hepatic artery at the upper border of the pylorus and runs to the left along the lesser curvature it supplies the lower right part of the stomach the splenic artery runs behind the stomach towards the left to reach the spleen the branches arising from the splenic artery near the hilum of spleen supplies the parts of the stomach the short gastric arteries arise from the splenic artery at the hilum of the spleen and pass forward in the gastrosplenic ligament to supply the fundus the left gastroepiploic artery arises from the splenic artery at the hilum of the spleen and passes forward in the gastrosplenic omentum or the ligament and supply the stomach along the upper part of the greater curvature the gastroduodenal branch of the hepatic artery gives rise to the right gastroepiploic artery which passes to the left and supplies the stomach along the lower part of the greater curvature the veins drain into the portal circulation the left and right gastric veins drain directly into the portal vein the short gastric veins and the left gastroepiploic veins join the splenic vein the right gastroepiploic vein joins the superior mesenteric vein before it joins the splenic vein the nerve supply includes sympathetic fibers derived from the celiac plexus and parasympathetic fibers from the right and left vagus nerves the anterior gastric nerve or vagal trunk which is formed in the thorax mainly from the left vagus nerve enters the abdomen on the anterior surface of the esophagus and runs along the lesser curvature of stomach and the part which goes to supply the pyloric part is called the anterior nerve of latter jet the trunk which may be single or multiple gives rise to gastric branches that supplies the anterior surface of the stomach a large hepatic branch passes up to the liver and from this a branch passes down to the pylorus called the pyloric branch and supplies the pylorus the posterior vagal trunk or gastric nerve which is formed in the thorax mainly from the right vagus nerve 
enters the abdomen on the posterior surface of the esophagus, runs along the lesser curvature and the part which supplies the pyloric part is called the posterior nerve of latter jet. The trunk then divides into branches that supply mainly the posterior surface of the stomach. A large branch passes to the celiac and superior mesenteric plexus and is distributed to the intestine as far as the splenic flexure and to the pancreas. The parasympathetic fibers are motor to gastric musculature and secretomotor to gastric glands. It inhibits the pyloric sphincter and stimulates the gastric musculature. The sympathetic nerves are derived from the 6th thoracic to the 9th thoracic segments of spinal cord, pass through the greater splanchnic nerves and relay in the celiac plexus and supplies the stomach through the postganglionic fibers. The fibers are primarily vasomotor. It stimulates the pyloric sphincter and inhibits the gastric musculature. It conveys painful sensations from stomach through the dorsal root ganglia from 6th thoracic to the 9th thoracic spinal segments. The lymphatic drainage of the stomach accompanies its blood vessels. Knowing lymphatic drainage of stomach is very important in relation to carcinoma stomach. The stomach can be divided into four drainage zones. Divide the stomach into pyloric part and the cardiac part by the line drawn from the incisura angularis. Further, divide the cardiac part by a line passing between the right two-third and left one-third of the stomach. Divide the left one-third into superior one-third and, and lower two-third. The superior or right two-thirds of the stomach drain along the gastric vessels to the left gastric nodes. Lymph from these nodes drain into celiac nodes. The left upper one-third of the greater curvature of the stomach drains into pancreatico-splenic nodes. The lymph from these nodes pass along the splenic vessels and drain into the aortic group or the celiac group. The left two-thirds of the inferior one-third of the stomach drain along the right gastroepiploic vessels to the right gastroepiploic nodes. The vessels arising from these nodes pass into the subpyloric nodes and then into hepatic nodes and finally into the aortic or celiac nodes. The pyloric part drains into subpyloric nodes, hepatic and right gastric nodes. The lymph from subpyloric then drains into hepatic and finally into celiac or aortic nodes. The hepatic and right gastric finally drain into celiac nodes. Coming to the clinical anatomy of stomach, let us go through each one with brief details. To start with radiology of the stomach, a plain erect film of the abdomen reveals a bubble of air in grey shadow below the left dome of the aphrom. This is gas in the fundus of stomach. To check the abnormalities of stomach, the following procedure is done. The x-ray is taken after the patient drinks a liquid that contains barium sulphate. The barium sulphate coats and outlines the inner walls of the upper GIT so they can be seen as dense white areas on the x-ray pictures. The procedure is called barium swallow. The barium swallow can help diagnosis of the following conditions of the stomach, position, movements and outline, iatal hernia, inflammation, blockages, gastroesophageal reflex disease or GERD, ulcers, cancerous and non-cancerous tumors. The wide variations in the position and shape of the stomach that we have already mentioned have come to light principally as a result of such investigations. The incompetence of the cardiac sphincter can be tested by tipping the subject head down. In this position, the opaque meal can be made to impinge against the cardia. Incompetence of this sphincter mechanism will be demonstrated by seeing barium regurgitate into the esophagus. Gastric pain is felt in the epigastrium because the stomach is supplied from segments of 6th thoracic to 9th thoracic a spinal cord. This is because both upper part of the abdominal wall and the stomach is supplied by the same segments of spinal cord that is 6th thoracic to 9th thoracic segments of spinal cord. Pain in the stomach can be produced by either muscle spasm or over distension. 
There may be adhesions across the lesser sac which brings the transverse mesocolon into intimate relationship with the stomach or greater omentum. In these circumstances, the middle colic vessels are in danger of damage during mobilization of stomach for gastrectomy. We know gastric canal is formed along the lesser curvature of the stomach. During swallowing, the liquid or bolus of food passes through this canal. This is the first part to come in contact with the food compared to the rest of the stomach and the gastric mucosa along the lesser curvature is exposed to irritant liquids and spices in the food. This results in the inflammation that is gastritis and ulceration or gastric ulcer. The vessels to the gastric mucosa along the lesser curvature do not arise from submucosal plexus in the stomach wall as in other parts of the stomach but arise directly from the right and left gastric arteries outside the gastric wall. These small mucosal vessels thus take a long course piercing the serosa muscular coat submucosa to reach the gastric mucosa. The long course of these vessels and the lack of submucosal plexus are thought to be the factors that are responsible for the development of lesser curvature ischemia and perhaps ulcerations. A posterior gastric ulcer or cancer may erode the pancreas giving pain referred to the back. Ulceration into the splenic artery which is a direct posterior relation may cause torrential hemorrhage. Okay? This is the clinical relevance which can be uh, written for the posterior relations of the stomach or the stomach bed. The exact means by which uh, the vagal fibers reach the stomach is of considerable practical importance to the surgeon. A vagotomy is a med medical intervention to interrupt signals carried by the vagus nerve. A vagotomy usually means cutting the branch of the vagus nerve that is responsible to secrete gastric acid. Vagotomy is performed to reduce the acid secretion in the stomach in severe peptic ulcer cases. A vagotomy can have different effects depending on where you cut the nerve. There are three types of vagotomy, truncal, selective and highly selective vagotomy. In truncal vagotomy, the nerve is cut at the gastroesophageal junction. Cutting the nerve here reduces gastric acid secretion but also reduces function of other organs that respond to the nerve. It can reduce bile and enzyme secretions from the liver, gallbladder and pancreas. These side effects can cause digestive difficulties though there are treatments to relieve them. It also reduces peristalsis, the muscle movements that, ca that carry food through the digestive system is rendered atonic so that it empties only with difficulty. Because of this, total vagotomy must always be accompanied by some sort of drainage procedures, either a pyloroplasty to enlarge the pyloric exit and render the pyloric sphincter incompetent or by a gastrojejunostomy to drain the stomach into the proximal small intestine. Drainage can be avoided if the nerve of latter jet is preserved, thus maintaining the innervation and function of the pyloric antrum. In selective vagotomy, the nerve is cut distal to the hepatic and celiac branches. If the anterior vagal trunk has to be cut, it is done below the origin of hepatic branch. In the posterior gastric nerve, it is cut below the origin of celiac branch. Hence, the hepatic and celiac branches are spared with normal functioning of the liver and intestines which are supplied by it respectively. In highly selective vagotomy, instead of cutting the trunk of the tree, only the branches of the vagus nerve that triggers stomach acid is cut. These branches connect the parietal cells in the stomach that release gastric acid. For this reason, the operation is also called a parietal cell vagotomy. Cutting this branch alone is equally effective as a truncal vagotomy in reducing stomach acid. A highly vagotomy is more specific to the problem of stomach acid and it doesn't cause the same side effects as a truncal vagotomy. However, it is technically more difficult and not many surgeons are trained to do it. It may be more difficult in people with significant inflammation from ulcers or scarring in their tissues or in people who have already had previous surgery for peptic ulcer disease. 
failure to cut the first branch called nerve of grassy supplying fundus will lead to recurrent ulcers the post surgical complications may include death bleeding injury to stomach and esophagus gastroscopy can help confirm or rule out the presence of medical conditions like gastritis or peptic ulcers the mucosa of the air inflated stomach can be inspected in the living subject through the gastroscope a gastroscope is a thin tube like instrument with a light and a lens for viewing it may also have a tool to remove tissue to be checked under a microscope for signs of disease it is also called upper endoscopy carcinoma stomach is common and occurs along the greater curvature on this account the lymphatic drainage of stomach assumes importance metastasis can occur through thoracic duct to the left supra clavicular lymph node which may be enlarged and become palpable this is the first sign of gastric cancer these lymph nodes are called signal nodes or virtuose nodes or troisier's nodes it is common in blood group a this palpable enlarged left supraclavicular lymph nodes is called troisier's sign one of the treatment advised for carcinoma stomach is partial or total gastrectomy the extensive lymphatic drainage and the technical impossibility of its complete removal is one of the serious problems in dealing with stomach cancer involvement of the nodes along the splenic vessels can be dealt with by removing spleen gastrosplenic and linorenal ligaments and the body and tail of pancreas lymph nodes along the gastroepiploic vessels are removed by excising the greater omentum however involvement of the nodes around the aorta and the head of the pancreas may render the growth incurable okay with this we complete the discussion on stomach